Hey folks, Joe Valley here. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Quiet Light Podcast. Today, we've got Nate from Centurica on the podcast. He just bought the company, Centurica is a due diligence firm. And it's kind of funny, um, Chris Yates, the original, uh, well, not the original founder of Centurica, but the previous owner of Centurica was Quiet Light's first guest back in 2007 on the Quiet Light podcast. Uh, and now Nate has worked out a deal with Chris at Centurica to buy the company. They've closed the transaction. And we talk about Nate's journey in terms of being an entrepreneur himself. He sold the business in 2017 um, and then built another company, a service agency, and uh, talked about his approach on how to approach Chris Yates, the owner of Centurica, uh, about working together and broached the subject of maybe someday one of us will sell to the other and how that led into, hey, you know, I might be ready now, working out how they came to an agreement on the purchase price, due diligence, how Chris, I'm sorry, how Nate actually financed the deal. He did it with an SBA loan. We talk about the SBA lender. We talk about the deal structure. We talk about the terms, all of that. And then he gets into uh, some of the key things that uh, a buyer needs to look out for uh, when buying a business, sort of red flags uh, that you look at. It's a great interview. Nate's a great guy. He's been around the e-commerce world for a long time. Um, let's take a listen to uh, the interview with Nate now from Centurica.com. Here we go. And before we go to Nate, folks, I want you to go to exitpreneur.io forward slash QL podcast to get your free digital copy of the Exitpreneur's Playbook. If you own an online business, and you don't know the value of it, come on now. If you're listening to me, you know I preach this. Get your free copy of the Exitpreneur's Playbook, exitpreneur.io forward slash QL pod. Same for buyers. If you're out there buying, if you're looking to buy an online business, don't you want the other opposing team's playbook? Pick up a copy of the free digital version of the Exitpreneur's Playbook at exitpreneur.io forward slash pod. All right, here we go. Off to Nate. Hey, Nate, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here. I'm excited you're here as well. I'm, I'm excited to hear all about the, the purchase of Centurica, due diligence, everything you've done. Um, and as I mentioned before we hit record, uh, how, I, how I need to get invited to one of your yoga retreats so that I can uh, rest up and be healthy again. Not that I'm unhealthy now. I'm okay. Yeah. But why don't, uh, why don't you give the folks a little bit of background on yourself so that they know a bit more who Nate Ginsburg is, which background is, and what you're up to these days? Yeah, I uh, would love to. And uh, first, for if they're uh, longtime listeners of the show, uh, was interviewed by Mark. This was, man, I think in 2017. So after, so uh, I'll get to it in my story, but uh, built, and, built and sold an FBA business that I exited in, uh, in 2017. And, and yeah, uh, came on the podcast to kind of share about my story then, or kind of like that, uh, that exit. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, here we are, uh, a couple years later and, um, and yeah, so we'll kind of, you know, uh, we'll pick up the story kind of where, where the last left off. So yeah, got into FBA, uh, built and sold, uh, my own FBA business exited in 2017, you know, but before it was cool <laughs> and, uh, and before the multiples were higher. Yeah. 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 All that being said, I got a, you know, I, I was happy with my outcome and, uh, and yeah, so, so my, my, my thing for a lot of years or kind of, uh, you know, like a core competence or skill as an entrepreneur that I try to, you know, just, uh, you know, leverage is, um, really like hiring, recruiting, uh, and remote teams. And so when I sold my FBA business, I had a, you know, a small, but you know, good team that was pretty much running that business for me, supply chain, finance, you know, Amazon account, et cetera. And when I exited that business, I kept my team and started offering services, which turned into Sellerplex, which is my other company. And Sellerplex, you know, fast forward has grown a lot. Uh, since then, the team now is uh, around 70 people all oh. over the world. Wow. We've got like, 20 in our supply chain department, 30 in Amazon account management. We've got a content team. We've got a, a finance team. And, uh, and so with Sellerplex, we about a year ago started to get into some due diligence projects, which 
kind of started actually, we were doing exit prep, working with some clients, you know, with some clients and their brokers on exit prep. And then, you know, due diligence is a lot of ways, just another side of the same sort of coin of exit prep. And so we, you know, modified the reports and work that we were doing on the exit prep side to start doing due diligence projects. And, and yeah, kind of threw our hat into that ring about a year ago. Um, and uh, last fall, things started to pick up a bit on the diligence side, you know, yeah, all of a sudden we were doing, you know, like a handful of projects or kind of started working with a few repeat buyer, you know, roll up aggregator type clients. And that got me thinking much more seriously about due diligence as a, you know, as a, a service in a sector. And, you know, I'd known of Centurica for, you know, many years, uh, a member of Rhodium Community. And so had known Chris through that. And, and yeah, so uh, Chris, the, the now former owner, uh, you know, we were friendly online. We never met in person, but, you know, had a few calls and, you know, we're, we're familiar with each other. And yeah, you know, I was just thinking, so, so Sellerplex would occasionally get leads from that went to Centurica, that Centurica was at capacity, that they came to Sellerplex. Yeah. And, and just sort of thought that there might be some, you know, some opportunities, you know, with Centurica. And again, kind of knowing my kind of core skill set around, you know, team, scaling team, scaling deliverables, and, and just, you know, client services. And so was thinking about this for a long time. And finally, one day, just like, you know, pulled the trigger, shot Chris an email. It's like, hey, you know, we're doing more due diligence. You know, if you're interested, maybe we can chat, see if there's any ways we can, you know, support, collab, and something. And uh, to my, you know, pleasant surprise, Chris shot me back like right away. Here, sure, here's my calendar link. Like I booked a call for like the next day. And, uh, you know, and so begins, you know, the next chapter in the story. And, and, uh, and now you own Centurica. He was probably so excited to get that email because well, <laughs> they've been, they've been so busy the last few years that, you know, with the growth of uh, the m and world, I mean, we personally grew 85% in 2021. Yeah, and that congrats. means Chris has to grow. And because we refer yeah. a lot of, a lot of clients over to Centurica. Mm-hmm. He was, was he, in, red, in in hindsight now, was he oh. afraid, of, afraid of the email, excited that it came no, through, well, willing well, to talk? No, he uh, was excited. You know, I mean, unbeknownst to me, like, you know, was sort of, um, you know, thinking, hoping, or I don't know, had a, a, a hunch maybe that there was something going in that direction. You know, for me, this was like, you know, this was like a big, I mean, was slash is a big deal for me. I've been thinking about this and thought it could be a fit and, and you know, I'm, I'm also not one, I don't want to get, you know, too far ahead of myself or things. And, and, you know, so, so yeah, was trying to stay focused on where things were at, but, but yeah, was, you know, was hopeful. And so actually a couple of weeks ago, met Chris uh, in person for the first time, there was a, a rhodium retreat in San Antonio that I kind of uh, went down to hang for a day and hung out with, uh, with Chuck of, of quiet light and more of that community. And, and Chris and I got to share the story to his Rhodium community. And it was, you know, cool kind of getting the both sides. Cause we, I mean, you know, we've had a lot of communication the last six months, but you know, long answer to yes. Uh, it turns out Chris was, you know, excited to get that email and kind of had an idea um, where it, you know, might be going. And uh, anyway, so on the call, we're talking, it kind of starts off pretty, I don't know, like not that exciting. Oh, well, maybe if you have capacity or you're at capacity, you could refer us. Or if we get things, we don't have scope. And then it was like, I brought up, I was like, well, um, maybe some point in the future, it could make sense for one of us to buy the other one. And, uh, you know, it's like dramatic pause, <laughs> you know, waiting. And, and, and then Chris comes back and was like, yeah, well, uh, if, if that's the case, you know, I, I think it'd make more sense for, for you to buy us. And, you know, I'm on the other side and just like, you know, trying to keep my cool. And I was like, oh, like, you know, how, how interested in that might you actually be? <laughs> and so it turns out Chris was interested and, uh, you know, thus kicked off, you know, what 
ended up being about a, a six month, you know, process from that initial email to finally, uh, you know, close transaction. And, uh, and yeah, you know, you're now looking at or talking to the, the proud owner of, of Centurica, which for a lot of reasons, and I'm happy to share, I really think is like my dream acquisition. And I'm just uh, so excited to, you know, be able to build on this incredible uh, legacy and to be the next steward of this really amazing brand. Um, it is yeah. an amazing brand. It, it, it is, you know, I, I've, I've known, I think, I think it must've been about the same time that Mark had you on the podcast in 2017. I mean, we launched the podcast and Chris Yates from Centurica was the, abs- the very first oh. guest ever to come on the quiet Light podcast. And we've referred so much business to them over the years or to you now, uh, because it's the right thing to do. Buyers that are buying these online businesses have to get an outside opinion, an expert opinion to look at things, in, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's the best thing they can do, the best money they can spend, uh, because it, you know it's not just a yes or a no. It's often yes, and here are the weaknesses that you can fix in this business. Here's the, the strengths. These look good. And sometimes it's all about the numbers, but sometimes it's about links and other things like that, too. So uh, I, I don't know any other due diligence firm that I've come across since I've been doing this since, since 2012, so for a decade now, that is as thorough, as detailed, and as reputable as Centurica. So congratulations to you. Congratulations to Chris. Um, I can tell right now one of the reasons why Chris was open to that was because of it was you and your personality, right? You've been smiling this whole time. The audience is like, wow, this, this, is like, this is a really likable guy. I want to talk to him. It's so, it's so critically important to be able to bridge that gap and, and, and be likable. Because if you go in trying to buy Chris's business, which was probably your wish the whole time, right? But you just let it flow to see where it went, but were likable and helpful all along the way. And turns out that that's what, that the timing was right, obviously, as well. Um, mm-hmm. Why was it so hard for you to send the email to Chris? You wanted to buy his business. Why not? Why not just yeah. do it? Yeah, I mean, g- good question. I guess it's the you know internal resistance. Narr- like because I was thinking, I don't know how long I was thinking about it, and you know, I guess what it is, and like, I mean, yeah, like side note about me, maybe you know, or I mean, many of your listeners, I'm sure, don't know, but like, I'm you know, I'm a like a junkie for you know personal growth and really into a lot of like mindfulness and and, I mean, been doing yoga for a long time and a lot of like, I'll say spirituality, but I hate that word, like not religious, but you know, uh, just like trying to be aware of what's going on and, and anyway. And so, so yeah, I think just like being aware, uh, well at the time it was this, like, you know, I had this, uh, you know, there was this, like this dream kind of in the background of, you know, buying Centurica, me becoming the owner. And, and yeah, like before sending that email, that dream was, you know, like it, it was alive. I mean, so uh, if I sent that email or, you know, we have that call and Chris is like, no, not interested all of a sudden, you know, maybe that dream is dead. And so, you know, I think there oftentimes we have this like resistance to doing, even we, we know what the next step has to be, but psychologically, we get this resistance because it's like, oh, well, what if I take that step and it doesn't work out? Well, it's, it's safer to not take that step. And then, you know, you'll never know. I mean, it, it, you'll never get that no. So it's like, I mean, it'll never happen either. But, but yeah, I think that's sort of where some of the resistance of, of instead of just like, you know, doing it. And normally, I'm, you know, I'm a person who usually, you know, does things and, you know. Did yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of this thinking, Jesus Christ, Nate, you, you, you built a successful business, you sold it, you've traveled the world based upon what I see on Facebook and your posts, uh, and now you're running a, another very successful business with Sellerplex. Why are you afraid of rejection? Why are you afraid of yeah. reaching out to Chris and being rejected? Yeah. Come uh, on, man. You got to hey, have more you know, confidence. Everybody's going to well, have more maybe. confidence. <laughs> being rejected is, is, is part of the entrepreneurial life, you know, well, it is what it is. So anyway. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a, a quick kind of side thing on rejection An interesting kind of surprising, you know, teacher in 
overcoming rejection actually was with the retreat that I uh, hosted at the end. Uh, it was the end of March. Uh, you know, we had it, but like that one of, you, you know, most people I reached out to couldn't come. So that was dealing with a lot of no's. Anyway, it's, it's a good skill to have, you know, overcoming those no's and staying positive. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Do you have any kids? No kids. Not, not yet. at this point. See, I've got, I've got two boys. They're 18 and 20. One's about to graduate, graduating high school in two days from the time wow. we're recording this Congrats. Um, and teaching kids to uh, get used to and expect rejection as they try oh. to reach their goals. It's, it's, it's hard. It's well, hard. It's hard, but I remember uh, when I was kind of in the midst of just like, you know, getting rejected by most of the people that I invited to come to my retreat. Um, and I mean, fast forward, it, it came together amazing. Uh, not that we need to spend too much time on that, but it did all work out. It was a blast. Um, but I was listening to this book. Uh, what book was it? The, the Sam, uh, Sam Zell, I think his story. Uh, I forgot what the name of the book is, but he, he had a line in there that like, uh, that the ability to overcome rejection or just deal with rejection is like one of the most important entrepreneur skills. And so I kind of had that line in the background as I'm, you know, reaching out to people and inviting people and, you know, most of them for whatever reason, aren't able to come. And so just had that's like, you know what, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, strengthening the muscle of overcoming rejection. Like this is good, you know, for my, you know, for my career. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, People that are in the audience that are acquisition entrepreneurs, meaning they're going to try to buy an online business, you know, they're going to face the same thing, um, trying to buy an online business. And in today's world, there's multiple offers on most listings. Quietlight had 3.75 offers on every listing in the last 12 months. Yeah. You know, things are, things are a little tighter with the Thrasio implosion uh, and, and lending tighten up briefly. People are getting a little scared, but I think it's going to be temporary. So rejection is something they've got to get used to. But once they get over that, or I think, I think to the point of you and your personality and connecting with Chris and Chris going, yeah, you know what? The time might be right. And you know, I know Nate, I know his reputation. I see what he does online. Seems like a great guy. He's been a member of Rhodium. You've got all these things that are working in your favor. And that helps that helps instill confidence in a seller in many ways. And oh. my most, the most memorable buyer-seller conference call um, I've had in a long time uh, was with somebody, unfortunately, that didn't get the, the, the deal, but he was most memorable because he was just simply the most likable. He didn't get the deal because he had SBA financing and somebody else had all cash. It wasn't his fault. But being likable is probably part of the reason why you now own Centurica. Oh, I mean, totally. Like, so Chris and I's just communication and relationship, you know, throughout the process was, you know, a, a, a critical piece that allowed everything to move forward. And, and I'll say that, I mean, things move forward, a, you know, about as well as either of us, you know, could have hoped. And, and yeah, uh, you know, a huge factor in that was because of you know, the communication between Chris and I, and, and I, I got to give Chris, you know, so much credit for making this process just easier for us both. And, you know, some things that we did, which Chris suggested was, um, you know, we got on once, once we kind of got serious about, you know, pursuing this, we were just getting on weekly calls just to check in, touch base, what's going on. And sometimes there wasn't a lot to report on. Hey, like, waiting to hear this back from the bank or this or that. And yeah, other times we had to like, you know, bang through our, you know, term sheet for what we needed to include in the APA and just like get, you know, we, we wanted to, and ultimately did really get clear on, you know, pretty much all the important points for Chris and I, so that when we gave it to the lawyers, it was just a lot, you know, we were already clear on the things that were important to us. So it was yeah. more just, you know, finalizing details. Yeah, we do that in the, in the, in the letter of intent at Quiet Light. A um, couple of things that we do that you're talking about is, is a letter of intent is really pre-LOI. It's all the bullet points that would go into the LOI. And therefore, mm -hmm. the LOI is pretty thorough uh, because the LOI is then all of the points that should go in the APA, the asset purchase agreement. It all flows from one thing to another. And then in due diligence, Nate, we set up most of the time 
weekly calls. And it's like every Tuesday at 10, we're all going to get together, the buyer, the seller, the broker. And sometimes, like you said, there's not much to say, mm. but other times it's, it's, it's really just continuing that positive communication as we go through this sometimes painful process of due diligence, because mm. uh, it, it can be pretty thorough. So yeah. um, let, let's, let's, you said bank. So let's talk about how you pulled it off as an ac- sure. acquisition entrepreneur. First, how did you come up with a value for the business? And then I want to talk about mm-hmm. the financing that you're talking about. Yeah. So um, the val- So this was a, uh, I don't know if you call it like an off-market deal. You know, I just, you know, this, the business wasn't listed. I reached right. out to Chris. Yep. You know, he was interested. I was interested. Okay, let's do this, you know, and, and, uh, and yeah, so, you know, at, at a point, so this was right around uh, before the, the holidays in, in the end of December, when I was going to Mexico for a few weeks and, and this was kind of like right before things kind of got serious because we were waiting for the 2021 numbers to come in to kind of officially proceed with some of the next steps. And, and anyway, I remembered, you know, we, we had a call scheduled, like our last call before, you know, I left for a couple of weeks and we were kind of, you know, taking a little break was around the valuation. And, you know, Chris, I mean, and I wanted to make sure that we were in agreement or at least, you know, ballpark in terms of what, you know, they were going to be agreeable to. and. And a couple of things, just a kind of side note uh, with this whole process. So, you know, because Sellerplex had been doing due diligence projects, you know, we, we were a competitor. And so because of that, the weight, like, you know, Chris would only share access, like there was a tiered access to certain information. You know, they weren't just going to open the whole kimono at first, you know, until, you know, yeah, there were different stages that until we knew the deal was going to get, you know, eventually get done. But yeah, the, the first, you know, next domino was, all right, like, are we, do we see eye to eye in the valuation? And so, you know, this was on me. I was like, all right, well, like, how do I value this? And so, so my thinking and what we did is, um, you know, I'm, I mean, been around the space and pretty aware of what, you know, standard multiples are for, you know, business type and size, et cetera. And what, so what I had access to when I was looking at, you know, I had their financials and, you know, the number that was shared with me was uh, on the, the p was, was owner's benefit. And so owner's benefit, you know, like, like SDE. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's SDE. Yeah. It, we used to call it owner, owner's benefit. It's easier to say owner's benefit because people understand what it, what it is. Sure. It's yes. seller's discretionary earnings. Right. So for those that don't know, basically it's the, the, the profit of the business, um, which includes any compensation for the, the owners. And so, and so, you know, one thing that, uh, well, it ultimately it affected the multiple, but in a part of this whole transaction was that, um, you know, so Brian, who was a, a, a co-owner in Centurica was also a key part in, you know, project manager, account manager in the, the delivery of the service. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that was important for a few things in terms of, you know, what multiple the business, you know, I think w- was appropriate because of, you know, key person risk or it just not coming with, you know, an operating team. Did you, did, did Brian transfer with a business or is he out too? So, uh, Brian, I mean, so basically, you know, have transitioned from like, you know, day to day to yeah. more, you know, advisory and, you know, supporting yeah. the team. So, but so building Brian out of being the main, you know, part of the deliverable, like was part of the, I mean, is slash was, you know, part of this transaction. Right. And so, and so, so anyway, we had this owner benefit number, um, you know, and aware of what kind of multiple roughly different size businesses get, uh, as well as, you know, the, the important point around, you know, Brian being like a key part of the deliverables. And so basically the way I came to the valuation is I took the owner benefit, um, subtracted an amount that I felt comfortable that it would cost me to basically, you know, replace Brian. Right or replace Brian slash Chris, but, you know, to, you know, bring in my own, uh, you know, deliverable, which also, and part of why this whole thing made sense is because like, I, I have a lot of pieces from the Sellerplex due diligence side that I'm able to plug in still things that need to be, you know, filled, but like, uh, you know, I, I wasn't like rebuilding this from, and I, I mean, 
I, I haven't needed to and didn't have to like rebuild from scratch, but there were some, you know, key roles that I would need to fill. So, you know, we took the owner benefit, deducted a, um, you know, deducted a, you know, an amount that I felt comfortable that I could, you know, uh, you know, rebuild replace or replace exactly the, the operations. And then, you know, tacked on a multiple to that. And uh, huh, I don't know if I'm uh, able to say exactly the multiple. No need for that. No yeah, need for I, that. Did it, say, did it, did you first, did you, when you presented it to Chris, were you nervous again for rejection? Or yeah, did he, you know, did you, I mean, well, how do you so, settle so, on the number? So, so Chris kind of, so he mentioned kind of a ballpark number that they were thinking, you know, at a previous point. And, you know, and my valuation came in, you know, right around in that, in that ballpark that he said. And so, you know, and so really like, and so basically like they were agreeable. I came up with a number that, I mean, I, I, I won't disclose the exact multiple, but I'll say for a business of, you know, that much, ultimately, you know, the, the profit multiple owner benefit minus, you know, whatever the cost to replace it was, I, I mean, if the business came with an operating team, the multiple would have been higher. And so, so, uh, you know, and it wasn't, I, I think it was a very fair, I mean, it was, you know, what Chris and Brian said they wanted. Also, when I did my calculations, it was consistent. That's, I mean, that's, that's the definition of fair. Everybody was happy, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's, that's the definition of fair. So, um, Centurica is, let's just talk about what, what Centurica does. Cause I think everybody that's listening, whether you're a buyer or seller needs to know buyers should be looking at the marketplace. Sellers uh, need to understand that buyers are probably going to hire Centurica for due diligence after the fact, or at least I hope they are, which is a funny thing because we're representing the sell side, but I've, I don't think I've ever had a deal fall apart in due diligence yeah. Uh, because of a, a report from Centurica, what buyers have determined is that you guys have pointed out some strengths and weaknesses of the business and places where there's growth opportunities uh, because of, of some weaknesses that need to be mm -hmm. plugged and fixed. So tell us what Centurica does. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so Centurica is the, uh, the leading premier buy side due diligence service provider. Some of this people might know, but what that means is, is you know, when people are buying a business, uh, usually after LOI, they will hire a due diligence firm such as Centurica to come in and, you know, really check the business to make sure that what they think they're buying, you know, or what they are buying is what they think they're buying. Um, which includes basically there's like three buckets of due diligence. We can say there's financial, there's operational, and there's commercial. So on the financial side, we're looking at, you know, verifying the PL with Centurica. We actually rebuild the PL from scratch. Uh, you know, in e-commerce, there's, you know, redoing the cost of goods, which often can be discrepancies. And, you know, discrepancies aren't always malicious and often they're not. It could be a lot of times as, you know, if you're a seller, you, you know, a lot of them aren't, you know, accounting whizzes or background and, and cost of goods is tricky. And so anyway, so on the financial side, we look at and verify, um, you know, what the numbers are in the business. Uh, operational side is, you know, digging more into like the business operations, uh, you know, how's it run? This also can be things depending on the business model, um, you know, kind of like uh, were, you know, potentially gray practices used that could come up at a later point and whether that's, you know, yep. spammy SEO or, you know, uh, gray hat, you know, giveaways, et cetera. Uh, and then you've got the, the commercial side, which is more like market analysis as a whole and looking at like, you know, product trends and market trends and, you know, total addressable market and market share. And, and that's kind of like, yeah, more um, kind of like, yeah, like, like higher level, like on like the, like the marketing or market analysis side. And so uh, what makes Centurica different and what I'm really excited to build on is, is really the, the niche expertise and understanding of these online business assets. And so, 
you know, Centurica comes from a, a history of, and I'm excited to build on, you know, we are online business operators, you know, we're native to the online business space. You know, the, the, the majority of the types of, you know, diligence reports that we do are going to be FBA slash e-commerce content sites, uh, SaaS businesses, um, you know, there some others as well, but you know, these are all ones like, you know, I've run, you know, I've run my own FBA businesses, e-commerce sites. I've run my own, you know, content websites. I've got, you know, I haven't run my own software, but like very familiar with the business model and have a ton of friends, you know, with this. And so, and so that's really, I think what makes Centurica unique is that like niche expertise when it comes to these specific business models and where that really becomes valuable to our clients is, you know, when they're hiring us to do the diligence. And again, we got financial, operational, commercial, you know, because we understand the nuances of these models, we're able to see things, especially on the operational and commercial side, that if you don't have that like intimate experience, you're not going to understand. And whether this is some gray hat practices that we just are aware of because, you know, we're in the space and, it's, you know, yeah, you've seen you know, it. Yeah, we've seen seen it. it. And, and, you know, that, and, and, and the thing is, and, and uh, some other trends that I think are interesting and and where Centurica is really set up to provide a lot of value is, um, you know, I know um, you've, I'm sure been experienced in noticing, you know, this trend of more like traditional finance, uh, you know, low mid market, private equity, there's all these, yeah, uh, traditional finance and money that's becoming interested in these online assets. And, you know, a lot of these types of buyers are, you know, look, like they're, they're very intelligent. They, they have a lot of money, you know, to spend, but really what they're lacking is like the niche expertise with these businesses. And so, you know, we can look at even like a Thrasio as an example and some of the challenges that they're facing now. And actually, uh, so uh, Sellerplex was a very, very early vendor with uh, working with Thrasio. And, um, you know, that story is, is for another time, but like, you know, we can tell these are, they're, they're very smart. They had a big, you know, big plans, big ambitions, you know, have a ton of capital, but, you know, they didn't come from, you know, they didn't have that like really intimate understanding of like these businesses and, you know. Yeah. For the most part, I think people that, unless it's the second time they're jumping into the space because they sold something like you did, and then you jump back in. A lot of folks are coming from the outside world, so they need your expertise. But one of the most important things I think that uh, you know a third-party due diligence firm like yours provides is uh, detached um, uh, advice and decision making and analysis. You're not emotionally tied to it. The seller might overlook things uh, because they just want to get the deal done. They work so hard to get it to this point, and they just want to get it done. And you guys bring together you know, more math and logic uh, to that approach. Uh, so good. I just wanted to touch quickly on what Centurica does in case the audience hasn't heard me talk about it a thousand times over the last five years. Um, let's talk about how you pulled this off financially. You said uh, banking and lenders. Did you end up uh, going with an SBA loan? Yep, uh, SBA. And, yep. Uh, you know, so kicked off the process with uh, Steven Spears and uh, e-commerce lending who, Yep. Uh, I'm sure is also a friend of the show and uh, in quiet he light. And yeah, he's a good guy. So, so he likes yeah. whiskey and he likes whiskey folks. If y'all see him <sighs> down in Florida, that's his drink of choice. All right. Well, uh, I, I, I certainly, uh, if I see him would, uh, you know, be happy to, to buy him a drink for, you know, the, the first step in facilitating the, the financing part. And so, um, and so, yeah, well, it kind of before that, you know, candidly, the, um, the, the valuation that, you know, Chris and I kind of napkin math agreed on, uh, I didn't have that, you know, available, at least like, you know, liquid available for sure. And so, you know, knew I would need to, you know, seek outside funding and, and yeah, you know, I'd been quite familiar with the SBA process. I had friends, many friends that have successfully done SBA deals and, uh, and yeah, had a relationship with Steven. And so that was kind of option one to explore for financing and, uh, you know, reached out to Steven you know, I had a number of conversations. I kind of got, you know, preliminarily approved, which kind of got us into the next step of, of uh, you know, really trying to get approved and working with Bill on his team, who who's also great to work with. And 
so yeah, basically worked with them to, to get the package together to then for them to go, you know, pitch to, uh, you know, the actual banks. And at, uh, at, at what point, I mean, first you had to agree with Chris on the price and then you had to get personally approved for the SBA loan. But then at, at a certain level, Chris has got to share his tax returns with Stephen to make sure that the business qualifies as well. What, at what stage did you do that? You know, I don't actually remember what was like between Chris and Stephen, but it, I mean, uh, like that all would have been like without like, there were things that Chris was sharing with either Stephen or the bank that I wasn't, you know, involved with at certain, you know, Okay. Chris and I both kind of had our like to do's and what we had yep. to communicate on. And so, so, so yeah, that- let's talk about the deal structure then if you're comfortable with it. Um, just from an SBA standpoint, I'm going to say that it was probably uh, 10% down, 90% paid over 10 years. They might've given you some working capital money as well. Interest rates, six and a half, seven percent 7%. How far off so, am I? Uh, close. So um so, and I'll kind of preface that there were a couple of interesting things that we had to overcome in terms of getting together the financial you know, package. And so one of them was Centurica grew a lot in the last three years. And um, you know, while that's exciting, that's also like potentially risk for the bank. And what I learned is there actually, there's some different metrics, which I don't know exactly, but like between growth rate and you know cash flow and this and like there are certain metrics based on the financials of the, the the business that like you know can be bottlenecks and so with with this uh there was something that basically because of the growth rate and whatever this you know formula um SBA was only going to be able to come up with 70% of the business price so this is, this is something for every buyer to listen to and every seller as well. Uh, don't expect, like with Stephen, what we used to get was a yes or a no, oftentimes, right? We'd send in the listing details and say, you know, this is the list price, does it qualify for SBA loans? And it was often a simple no until we got to know him and started saying, let's not go with a no, let's go with a yes, but. Yes, but you need to come up with 30% down or yes, we've been in situations where it's, qualifies with 50% down. 50% down is better than 100% down. So we, buyers know that it's it's not just always a yes or no. You got to be flexible in some cases. Right. And this was somewhere that uh, Chris really, you know, uh, amazingly kind of jumped in into this process where, you know, we kind of sent it over and then the initial was like, oh, like, you know, we could have some challenges based on, you know, some of these things they were seeing. And then, and then kind of, as this was like, uh, you know, I wasn't involved in this, you know, discussion, but Chris jumped in with, you know, Steven or Bill and was like, all right, like, what do we got to do? Da, 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 da. And it turned out that, you know, the, you know, the like restriction was that SBA was only going to be able to come in for 70%, which meant that, you know, for me, uh, well, you know, I was, uh, I guess like uh, the, the the plan or what we discussed was coming in for 20%. And then, you know, the way we filled that last 10 was, you know, seller financing. And so that was a little bit of like Chris jumping in being like, all right, like, what's the situation? How do we problem solve? And, uh, you know, so that's, that's what we did. So yeah, those are the terms. It was 20 down, um, 70 bank and 10 uh, seller. Excellent. The uh, term of the loan from the bank and the seller note are generally incredibly favorable. Uh, I'm sure on the 80%, it was probably 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 10 years. I think it's right. prime plus 275. Okay. So it fluctuates um, a little bit. And what what were the terms on the seller note with Chris? What did the bank require? So this is, they had some interesting, I mean, the whole thing with, you know, the bank has a number of requirements for different things. And, and, and so, so a few on the seller note, um, I think it, it needs to match the same terms as the SBA loan. And so 10 year, same, you know, same rate. Straight, um, straight. So there was no standby or balloon payment option. Uh, it is, uh, it is. So there was two years, um, okay. I guess, right. you know, so there's two standby. year. Two, a two year standby. standby, a two year standby folks means that uh, Chris, the seller of the business has to wait two years before that seller note kicks in. And the reason yeah. why, 
the bank does that, the SBA does that, is to protect their investment so that, Nate, you have as much cash available to uh, learn the business and grow and pay that note back, right? right. They're really making sure that they're uh, protecting their business. So they you know, say right. two-year two standby. Okay, so, two-year standby, so, five-year payment and balloon payment at the end? I think... I'm uh, I'm not sure. It might be ten year. I don't know. I'd have to. I've done it. I've done a few of these. So <laughs> what they probably did is uh, they they do a ten year amortization. They two year standby, and then they amortize that loan over ten years. So the payment is lower, but then there's a balloon payment in five years. And mm-hmm. in five years, um, you would go back to the SBA to get the balance to pay Chris off. Mm. Maybe that's not the case, but it's often the case of of deals that I see with Steven. Anyway, it's it's an amazing way to buy a business like this. So now that you have it, you know what your required revenue is and whatnot. uh, How are you going to change it? You're not going to fix things that are not broken, I'm sure, but are you yeah. going to enhance the service? What, what, what are your plans yeah. for the business? Uh, thank you. Yeah. And this was like, you know, it's funny. I kind of, uh, you know, was like, had to sell so many people on, you know, why am I the right fit for this business? And what's my, you know, conversations with tons of people at the bank. I spoke to like, you know, probably like four or five different ones on, you know, why am I, you know, first, you know, Steven and Bill and then the bank. And anyway, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I really believe that for a combination of reasons, like I'm, you know, really like the right steward to, you know, take Centurica into this next, you know, phase of its, of its existence. And, uh, and so, um, you know, some of the things that I'm really excited to, you know, bring to Centurica, you know, one is again, uh, back to saying my, I'd say core competency around recruiting remote teams, scaling capacity, you know, that has been a, constraint for Centurica over the years in terms of capacity and, you know, having to turn down deals or not being able to turn things around as quickly because of capacity. And uh, so that's one thing I'm excited to resolve. Uh, The next is, is again, kind of building on my just like strength as, you know, in recruiting and remote teams, you know, excited to, so the Centurica reports are, are great. You know, I think it's the industry standard, you know, tons of repeat buyers. That being said, there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, go deeper into certain areas and, you know, and really like, you know, by getting the right additional, you know, analysts or, you know, whatever type of business uh, expertise on on our side, you know, that's going to allow us to, you know, make the reports even more valuable and, and tailor even more towards whatever our clients need. And so, you know, and as I've been stepping into Centurica, you know, I've been becoming more aware of, you know, things that like Centurica does really, really well and that I'm happy to, you know, jump into and take over. And so, for example, um, you know, Centurica has got a very, you know, specced out kind of core delivery and that it's really been you know, like that's kind of been the main, the main delivery. There's a, there's a certain scope for it. And look, people are happy, but, but yeah, I think, you know, what, what I bring in with the team that I'm, you know, bringing in and building is uh, more dynamic towards what our, our clients need. And so, you know, one example even is, um, and actually I think we're, we're talking to, uh, to someone at Quiet Light about doing some uh, like quality of earnings, uh, you know, in addition to the, the standard scope. And this seems to be, you know, a need for, you know, on the bigger deals, especially, um, yeah. you know, there's a need to do, you know, quality of earnings. And, uh, and that's something that like, you know, I've got a, a great finance department and finance lead. And, you know, we are excited to be able to expand now in those areas because of, you know, the, the existing team that we have, as well as like my confidence and ability to just get the right person that we need in order to, you know, solve whatever the, the, the challenge is. And so that, that gives us the opportunity to really, you know, expand, expand the, the depth, well, go deeper um, into certain areas of the reports, um, expand into new areas, whether it's, you know, quality of earnings, um, you know, more like in-depth, like commercial diligence analysis for, you know, whatever business model. Um, 
as well as, you know, like I said, with Sellerplex, we have a lot of, especially e-commerce, you know, like we have a, a big supply chain department. And so the, the depth of analysis that we can provide when it comes to, you know, supply chain, which, you know, these days, obviously, uh, you know, pretty, pretty hot topics, um, you know, th this all becomes additional value that we can bring to the reports, bring to our clients that, yeah, that I'm excited to, you know, excited to, you know, be able to, to bring and keep, you know, building on the amazing foundations that Centurica has. Man, you, you stepped into what I think is, you know, the gold standard when it comes to due diligence in the online space. And I have no doubt that you're going to take it to the next level. There's a great team there. Um, uh, Brian's been great. Uh, tried to connect with him a, a couple of years ago. We were going to have lunch in the area as, as he was going mm -hmm. up to uh, to the mountains. And then I think the pandemic hit, so we couldn't pull it off. Uh, and, and, and I see Chris occasionally at at, at Rhodium Weekend. For folks that are not familiar with Rhodium Weekend, just go to rhodiumweekend.com. It's an amazing group of entrepreneurs that um, are not just physical product e-commerce or Amazon business owners. There's a lot of content, a lot of service, a lot of SaaS in that group. And, and people like Chuck Mullins, who's on the Quiet Light team, that's you know been an entrepreneur since he was in college. And Chuck's in his 40s now. And in college, he made more money uh, as a, as a student than most people make in, in, uh, 10 years. Uh, so really, really sharp people over at, uh, Centurica, I mean, at, uh, at Rhodium weekend. And of course at mm -hmm. Centurica as well. All right. So now that you're a due diligence expert, I knew you were, were before with Sellerplex, we were starting to get word of what you were doing there. What are sort of the top things that a buyer should keep an eye out? What are the red flags when they're just looking at listings to start with, whether it's a quiet light listing, FE International, website closers, or direct with an entrepreneur that's selling directly to, uh, to a buyer? Uh, what, 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 what are the red flags that you would say, yeah. always keep an eye out for this? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I'd say like the, the biggest red flag, I'd say, you know, which is the easiest, like, you know, uh, yes, no, in terms of making a decision is, is going to be around the financials. And so, and this one is a little bit, you know, and one, because I know like quiet light, for example, you guys work with the sellers to, you know, help them make sure that like the financials aren't bogus at least, but, but yeah, but I think like, you know, and it's, I don't know if you, if this is that apparent, you know, in the SIM or, you know, in any of the marketing material that they would see, but just like, if you can detect any intention to like intentionally deceive is, you know, run away. And, you know, you might not be able to see that beforehand until you're, you know, really kind of having conversations, but, you know, and look, there's one thing where, you know, uh, none of us are perfect. We can really do our best on, and a lot of sellers, you know, they, they, you know, they try and they do their best on the financials but for all the reasons they're not, you know, up to the, the standard that, you know, really a, a buyer needs to see, and there could be some mistakes and look like that happens. That isn't, that isn't necessarily a red flag where it becomes a red. Let me give you an example of where it happens just so that people get a, an actual live example. When I sold uh, Mike Jackness's business, color it, we've done, he, he's been on my podcast. We've been on, he has talked about it dozens of times. Uh, Centurica did the due diligence and prior to kicking off due diligence, he sent it out to Brian, man, this is going to be a breeze. My books are in perfect shape, mm -hmm. right? It's, like, it's the worst thing to say because it turns out that it wasn't <laughs> malice. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't fraud. It wasn't anything. It's just that the person that he hired to, you know, import the P&Ls and get them all in QuickBooks didn't properly convert foreign currency. And it was caught by due diligence. And so, you know, it was about a $5,000 difference. The business sold somewhere in the three to four time range. And so it was caught. Mike was embarrassed and frustrated. And the owner, the buyer, a guy named Matt was like, dude, everybody makes mistakes. It's okay. Let's go with math and logic. And 3.5, three times that $5,000 in the price could be adjusted simply and mathematically like that. Now, in this case, the business is growing like crazy. And Mike is a very likable guy. He's very trustworthy and honest, as is the buyer of the business. And when you have that, 
little mistakes like that, they like, whatever, you know, it's, the business has grown 15% since we went under letter of intent. I'm not going to worry about it and, yeah. and move forward, things like that. Well, right. A perfect example. And, and again, with a lot of the discrepancies that will happen in the, in the financials, I mean, especially on the e-com side, like, you know, cost of goods is, it's tricky, you know, it's tricky to calculate, um, you know, our team has like very intimate experience with cost of goods and supply chain and how all the pieces fit together. So, you know, we can confident, like we we're confident that we, you know, we know how to put that together, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of accountants and bookkeepers don't. And so it's not, you know, again, it's like not, not malice, but yeah, uh, you there's know, a lot of moving. Time. I mean, you've got you've got duty, you've got freight, you've got cogs that change from exactly quarter to quarter, things of that nature. One of the you know that that's something that is hard to discover and find. I mean, uh, I guess when you're looking at a PL, folks, all you've got to do is take the cogs by month divided by the revenue by month, and if it's going up and down like crazy, they've done it on a cash basis instead of accrual. Um, I I was talking to. Um, uh, a gentleman from uh, a VASC group, a VASC accounting yesterday, and, and talked about COGS and calculating it and wanting inbound freight to be on an accrual basis. And it's a really, really hard thing to do. And so that seems to be on a cash basis in most situations. Um, but you can sort of extrapolate it out and flip it to, to, to accrual. The number one flag for me would be that um, a seller only provides financials in a PDF. Number one, forget about it. I can't do anything with that. Number two, don't give me quarterly. Don't give me semi-annual or annual numbers. <laughs> this, is, this is the online world. Things change from month to month. We need to see a monthly view of the P&Ls going back as far as possible. And, and as far as possible is not just because you started using QuickBooks 12 months ago, but the business is five years old. You got to go back. You got to go further. To do what? To instill confidence in the buyer, first of all, they've got to believe in you and the seller and trust in the numbers that you're putting together. So I love the fact that you said the numbers first, because this is the first thing that people look at. They look at the multiple, which mm -hmm. is numbers, right? It's a multiple of owner's benefit or discretionary earnings. And then they're going to dig into the workload of the business. Then they're going to look at risk, growth, transferability, documentation, all those key things that you looked at when you were buying Centurica. What's the risk? Mm -hmm. Man, this thing's grown crazy over the last three years. Is this going to continue? I'm paying for that, but it's going to go down. Transferability, Brian Denier, right? Is that how you pronounce his last name? Key, so. key, key, yeah, key player in the business. How do you handle that? You work through that. Um, the, the growth trends going up or growing down, obviously still growing. Um, and you with your experience and your relationships with lots of different buyers and sellers and aggregators and private equity firms and come to the quiet light, you're going to be able to grow it. I have no doubt. Um, but all of those things come into play. None of them are red flags, except the financials. That's really obvious. Yeah. yeah well, well, I think, I mean, you know, the, the finance, you know, you gotta, you know, you need to know that the value, like, however, the valuation was, you know, however, the valuation uh, was, was came to, you, you need to, you know, be hundred percent confident in those inputs that led to the output of what you're paying. And so, so yeah, that's why, I mean, you know, I think the, that's the, well, is a red flag if it's not, well, you, you know, you need them. Um, and, and yeah, and just like, to, you know, other things is, is, uh, and this is where it gets, you know, a little more like later in the process, but just, you know, being aware of some different tactics that the business you know, has used or does use. And look, I'm not saying that that necessarily is a red flag. Maybe you're comfortable with that. And, you know, there's a lot of tactics that a lot of people use for a lot of businesses that, yeah, might be gray, but are also fairly common. And, and look, like it's as a due diligence provider, it's not, it's not our position to say like, don't do, you know, this is, you know, bad, you shouldn't do the deal. We're more like, you know, an independent objective observer. And we can just say like, look, you know, these are some things that we found, uh, you know, here it is. And, you know, whatever you want to do with that information, you can do. It's like, we're not, you know, our position isn't to tell them like, 
yes, do the deal or no, don't do the deal. Our job is just to, you know, dig into all the areas that we discuss, yeah. you know, and report the findings so that the buyer can make the, you know, an educated decision. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So it's, it's funny. We, we do the same thing, Nate, but we're on the sell side. We don't sell anything to anyone. We present facts about the business and let the investor make the decision. And then you, and, you know, present facts about the business in due diligence and let them, you know, decide whether they've made a good decision and want to move mm-hmm. forward or a bad one and are going to pull the plug. Yeah. yeah. And, and something else on that of where, uh, you know, I know that like, you know, it's kind of a, well, potentially a fine line or something that with Centurica, we certainly don't want to like, you know, our place in the ecosystem, you know, we, we have a great relationship with, you know, brokers such as Quiet Light and, you know, our job, you know, we want to, you know, we, we, you know, dig into the areas, we're going to report what we find, but like, we're not there to, you know, ultimately we want the deals to get done just like everyone does. And like, you know, we are not there to make things unnecessarily hard for anyone. It's like, look, there is a, you know, a standard, you know, scope that, you know, as a buyer, you're going to want to look into. And then, you know, it's your decision. It's like not our place to come in and, and, you know, getting into like, you know, retrading things or this or that. I mean, if, yeah, if no, the buyer wants to do that. The buyer and the seller should do that or the advisor in between. Yeah. No. Right. But that is something that, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of, you know, some, yeah, like it's, you know, like some due diligence, you know, providers, like it's, it's, it's easy to sort of cross some lines potentially when you're in that spot. And like, that's something yeah. that, you know, really try to stay as object, you know, look, this I think is what you, we I, found. I think you stay out of it. I think, I think what you're talking about is exactly right. Present the facts and let them make their decision. Just like, I don't, I don't ever want to see a, a CPA doing due diligence on an e-commerce business that somebody's buying. It's a terrible idea. They don't know anything about online businesses. You know, they're just maybe going to understand the numbers, but probably not even then. I think you guys are so, so well suited for this. And I'm excited that you're at the helm. Uh, you know, I think Chris, Chris and Brian did an amazing job with it, did a great uh, job building the brand and reputation of it. And it's great to see it go into the next good hands to take it to the next level. Chris and Brian took it as far as they wanted to, as far as they could. Um, and now you're excited, fresh, fresh idea, fresh blood, um, fresh additional services. So I'm, I'm real happy for you. I'm real excited about it. Um, we're running out of time here a little bit, Nate. Nate, um, how, do, how do people find you? How do they find Centurica? How do you spell it? Where should they go? Yeah. How do they, all that stuff. So anyone interested in uh, you know, any of our services? So Centurica.com, C-E-N-T-U-R-I-C-A.com. Uh, Feel free to, you know, if you want to reach out to me, Nate at Centurica or at Nate Ginsburg, all the social. Um, and yeah, you know, really we want, you know, we slash I, like I'm a big believer that like, you know, we are here to be of service. Um, you know, creating value for others is how we receive value for ourselves. And so, yeah, like I want to be and the Centurica team, you know, First and foremost, we want to be of service. We want to be helpful. And if there's things that you think we can help with, you know, please reach out. You can contact us, uh, you know, on the website, send me an email. And yeah, now that I've taken over the business, I'm just excited to connect even more with everyone, you know, in the ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, if that's you and you're interested in connecting, you know, please reach out and uh, excited to, you know, be in in this space for you know the long term to come and uh you know keep growing alongside awesome other companies such as such as quiet light so uh joe th- thanks for having me on super fun to chat and uh you know i guess we'll have to link up in person here yep. hopefully sooner rather than later yep my pleasure my pleasure i'm excited for you congratulations it's a great success story and uh and and, and i like it so much because you're going to help so many people right you're not just selling more socks. You're going to be helping entrepreneurs uh, exit businesses, protect their businesses when they're buying, and it's all about their families as well. So congratulations, Nate. Thanks for coming on the podcast. We'll catch up with you soon, okay? Thanks for having me. Sounds good.